I mean, a lot of people talk about striking the root. I mean, the the root of a lot of this is the state monopolizing food production in some way. I'm sure some folks will still participate in politics, hoping they can find a benevolent ruler to at least mitigate uh, some of the infringements in place now. But guys, that's, that's, that's a road to nowhere. It's a road to beatdowns on the street, extortion, and democide, with an even greater loss of freedom year after year, election after election. And it's, it's one of the most vicious falsehoods perpetuated throughout the ages. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, naive notion that politics can set you free. Uh, and that's why I've been so harsh on the anti-libertarian libertarian party, uh, because, uh, as I've said before, the people are sick of politics, the left-right paradigm, so what do they do? They give them more politics. It's, uh, it's the most uh, uh, insincere and ingenuine thing you can do to a fellow human being. It really is dangerous to be an anarchist, and it, it will only get, I mean, it, you know, as per kind of the, the stages of Agoras and that Konkin kind of laid out, it, it, it's going to get worse, and then it's going to get better, but, you know, when, when's it, when's it going to get, start getting better? You're listening to Liberty Under Attack Radio, and now your host, Shane. Welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism in action. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the communist state of Illinois. This podcast and everything found on the website is covered by BIPCOT, no government license. This allows reuse and modification to anyone, except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can learn more at BIPCOT.org. So guys, I've still got custom LUA direct action over political crusading shirts available. If you want to show your distaste for what the anti-libertarian libertarian party is doing there locally, as well as promoting real solutions... This is the shirt for you. It's extremely high quality, printed on a 100% gilded cotton shirt. Uh, it's here for the long haul. Now, for me personally, I've worn mine a lot in uh, about five or six months, and it's been run through the washing machine accordingly. So probably, uh, oh, I don't know, once a week, five times, maybe, you know, 20, 25 times through the washing machine, and it still looks brand new. Uh, so we've got small, large, and extra larges available for $15 a pop, free shipping included, and I'll get you a, a few of the stickers with the same design and uh, some other goodies. I've got a lot of stuff I'm trying to give away, and uh, you know I'll definitely toss some of that stuff in. So just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash shirts, or message me on fascistbook to order, uh, or anyone that signs up to support us on Patreon for $5 or more a month will get one sent to them. Uh, so help me get rid of these puppies, certainly appreciate it. So today I'm joined by a returning guest. Uh, the downloads on the podcast feed and uh, view views on the fa on the fascist book video prove to me that his work is in high demand and rightfully so. Um, welcome welcoming back Jamin Baconic, a fellow freedom pioneer, Vanuan, and someone I would call a friend. Uh, you can find our last discussion by visiting libertyunderattack.com forward slash LUA podcast 46 uh, or just find episode 46 on your favorite podcatcher. He's developing a lot of terrific things in the crypto anarchist realm and is doing something I plan on doing or pursuing in the next uh, couple of years permaculture farming. We'll uh, get an update on the former and dig into the latter uh, in today's discussion. So, Jamin, welcome back to the podcast, man. Uh, how are things going? All right. Um, thanks for having me back, Shane. Hey. Doing pretty good here. Hey, not a problem. Not a problem, man. So, I guess, first question, are you still rocking that, uh, that uh, you know, Goodwill Ben, uh, you know, rock band microphone? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, I'm very happy with it for the price, for sure. <laughs> you know, I, I am too. I remember when we when we interviewed when we did, uh you know recorded that first discussion, you told me about that. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be this little sketchy, but he sounds good. There's no line static in his microphone, uh, or at least it doesn't show up on the uh, I guess on the wavelengths, if that's the best way to put it. So I was like, oh, you know, it works, it works, and you know the audio came out fine. So I don't know, maybe you should start offloading those to podcasters for like ten dollars a pop or something. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's I was collecting them. Well, um. You know, I was collecting with the idea of, you know, these neuron machines, especially the ghost pads being uh, podcast worthy, 
and just to have a bunch of USB mics to see how many mics I can get going and stuff like that. Right, right. <laughs> very good, very good. So, so last time we talked, you told us all about your your ghost pads and alluded to some other projects that you were working on. So let's get an update on what you're doing, starting with uh, with I guess with the ghost pads in in the past uh, you know few months or so. Uh, what, what's the uh, what's the status with those? Well, I uh, got the the next generation ones that I was talking about last time. Um, I got prototypes of those built. And I sold a couple, and um, basically I've worked a couple bugs out that popped up when I did the modification, and uh, now they're rock solid. I just today finally replaced my um, mobile workstation I had that was my main like desktop replacement computer with a uh, T520 ghost pad that's maxed out with a quad core processor and like uh, 16 gigs of RAM and a SSD and everything. And um, very happy with it. I have it driving two 24 inch Dell studio quality, like um, the 1920 by 1200 displays, like the little bit taller than 1080p, uh -huh. like the, that all the professional displays used to be before they, everybody decided to go with the 1080p standard because TVs used it. But um it's working pretty good, and um, I have a uh, couple special purpose machines that I don't know if we talked about them when um, we talked last, but one is uh, basically an ultra portable that is uh, based off of the you know four or five, four or five twenty or two twenty series of um, the ghost pads. And um, I've been experimenting with using it for different things. I uh, went on vacation to the beach for a week, and I all I, I brought two ghost pads and um, put them through some tests and just saw what it was like to you you know just to have those machines and not my whole room. If you'd see the thing I have, like I don't know, eight displays around me right now. So <laughs> right, right. Interesting. So, so, so I guess just to, to touch on something you mentioned there. So, so what's the difference between these new gen machines versus uh, what you were, uh, I guess, what you were, what you had for sale last time? What are some of the, the the advantages to those? Well, there's three important differences that are advantages, and one slight disadvantage. The advantages are that um, they support CPUs that can do multi-threading so the base model can run four threads at once it has a second generation i5 in it and they can also be upgraded to a four core eight thread i7 up to a third generation one so they have this you know they have double to quadruple the processing power of the fastest ghost pads based on the 500 400 and 200 series lenovo's Okay, so it's, um, so it's so, so it's the speed then, speed and, yeah, the speed then. Well, and it's what you can do with the speed. It's see that's part of the equation is the speed. They um, have twice the RAM capacity, which is eight, from eight to sixteen gigs. The five hundred, four hundred, and two hundred series has a maximum of eight gigs. So basically, it can have four times the processing power and twice the maximum memory, and it also supports some next generation virtualization features that you need to run an operating system like cubes mm. to use it to its full effect the uh, 500 400 and 200 series like that whole generation they lack the iommu support that enables you to do cool stuff like i'm doing right now to talk to you using pci pass through to a um, virtual machine like it can basically, you can assign slots or devices directly to the virtual machine and it really doesn't go through any type of host OS to access them. So one of the cool things you can do with that is people have been um, using GPU pass-through to install a Windows virtual machine on their Linux boxes and be able to fit, play Windows games at, you know, the full frame rate. What they you know if they were native on a uh, bare metal machine wow okay so so that was that was one of the i guess one of the reasons why 
Um, I think someone like, uh, I think this is something Brian Sovereign mentioned, a lot of people have Windows machines because they still do the gaming. You know, they, they need a Windows machine to, to do the gaming. So so what you're saying is that with Linux Cubes and, and the operating, the, the OS, I guess the, the system you're running now, uh, you can run Windows, you know, Windows games, you know, fully functional on a Linux Cubes machine then. Yes, I mean, with, I mean, I haven't, um, I haven't tried it on cubes itself, but there there are a lot of other projects that are based on the same technology cubes uses. When um, I've read a lot of uh, forum posts of people having a really good luck with doing that. Um, the way, see the way cubes works is it's basically Linux on top of Zen. Zen is a what you call a hypervisor, and it's basically you know you're your operating system kernel, you could think of the supervisor of your operating system. Well, this is super, this kind of supersedes and supervises all the operating system kernels of the virtual machines you're running. So basically it is installed onto the bare metal machine and then everything else is installed on top. Um, so one of the products I plan on coming out with will be able to be, do the GPU pass through um, and it will probably be based on cubes since cubes is already all put together. I just haven't had, um, you know, that's that's something that needs a lot more testing and R and D on my part. But you know, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, if you look for GPU pass through, for let's say like the Q QEMU emulator or virtual machine virtual machine um, player, that you'll see people having luck with even that one. So this mm. is even lower level. Interesting, interesting. So, so just one note for the listeners, real quick, and it's probably something I should have mentioned in the in the introduction, but it, it should have been should have been very clear. It's gonna be a very tech heavy podcast, um, but uh, you know, cri crypto anarchism. I, I really do think, and I've said this many times before. Uh, you know, folks like Jamin are the ones that are going to really be pioneering these technologies. You know, uh, in furtherance of, of privacy. Uh, you know, when it comes to cryptocurrencies and, uh, and encryption, all of those great things. So, uh, very tech-heavy podcast, but very, very necessary. And uh, once you see, once you hear more about uh, the stuff that he's working on, uh, I think you'll you'll understand the. Uh, if you don't already, you'll understand the the uh, the the significance of uh, of what he's doing. So. Uh, so some of this stuff is over my head too, guys. But uh, at the same time, you know, I, I think Jamin, uh, Jamin explains these things uh, very, very well. So uh, sorry to, to jump in there for a moment, but uh, if you want to continue with what you're saying. Oh, no, that's no problem. So basically, you know, I, I have that in the works, and that's part of a, a larger a larger project. I've, ta I've talked about um, the device for uh, VPN and Tor routing and kind of shielding you from your ISP's hardware probably last time. Well, I am actually planning a line of devices like that, accumulating with one that can act as a set on um, a home theater PC and gaming system. Mm -hmm. So it would basically be a personal cloud server that did all your security and um, was completely compartmentalized through either cubes or the same scheme cubes uses with, um, you know, Steam running using GPU pass-through to a decent graphics card. So the, uh, and the low end of that line would be a small single board computer and a uh, custom little 3D printed box that you could simply use for um, the, all the basic functions of, uh, of a freedom box. Okay, interesting. Which we can get into. Yeah, yeah, let's 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 do that. So so I guess uh, uh, for for those I, I watched uh, I watched one, when we were talking about you know preparing for this episode or when we were preparing for this episode, you I watched a, a short video on it. Um, so I kind of have a little bit of an idea, but but what is a what is a freedom box, and I guess what significance would that have to to folks that are you know freedom oriented and and you know, care about privacy? Well, basically, freedom box is a project that's been going on since maybe, uh, oh man, I want to say maybe 2008 or something. Um, and what it does and what it's aimed to do is be a low, um, a very inexpensive piece of hardware that will allow you to um, route all your network traffic to, you know, through your internet service. It'll, it will allow you to route that through either Tor or a VPN and it'll have basically like enterprise grade functions on it 
that are scaled down for personal use. Like it has a personal cloud file server. So you don't have to put your data on, you know, Google's cloud or Amazon's cloud or any of these cloud services out there that are basically, you know, going to sell you out as soon as they get an opportunity. Well, or they, 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 they already are. I mean, or, or they, you know, they are, oh, they, yeah, already, they yeah. already do, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, to, you know, kind of gain back that autonomy and still have the convenience of being able to access your files from anywhere. Well, this, this would be working on its own encrypted VPN that you would only have the keys to. Right. So, so, so what, so what you're, so what you're talking about here then is essentially, um, and I remember, I remember that in that video, it was, it was just a small little box. So this would be a way to route your general internet traffic through, through your, uh, your modem and your router through this box um, so that it's uh, run through a VPN or Tor. Uh, and then on top of that, this little, this little box would also be a personal cloud server. Yes. Wow. Um, and it can also, I mean, depending on the hardware it's run on, um, there are a lot of functions you can add to it. And it's really like, uh, use, use your imagination what a general purpose computer can do. So you can have your own surveillance on it, um, depending on the hardware you're using. Um, you can, uh, like I said, do all the other things I was talking about, like home theater PC and gaming and everything else, depending on the hardware of this machine. But the low end ones, will be able to do those basic functions. And what's really cool is there are a lot of people working on adding functions to this, um, this uh, you know, idea, this Freedom Box project. And um, some of those functions are things like mesh networking. So the, the plan and the strategy is to rely on the fast connections we have now, but at the same time, the developers of the, and people around the project and doing similar things, they're all figuring out ways around internet blockages and internet kill switches and um, censorship and whatnot. So what, like once somebody wouldn't have this hardware, software features would be free. You know, added software features would be free and just from an update versus like, you know, the uh, closed source model, they lock everything up and you have to pay for each key to each function. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, these machines would be able to, you know, get, get new functions as the apps are developed and matured. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, so, so that kind of, so the freedom box then ties into the mesh networking. So, so the, I guess the, the, the idea now is, is privacy, you know, still using the, the, uh, the first realm uh, internet, uh, the first realm infrastructure and, uh, you know, focusing on privacy. And the next step then would be to, uh, you know, if there, if there was such a thing as it, or I guess if, if there was ever a time when the internet was shut off, these little boxes could be, um, you know, used as, as mesh networking. And I guess, first off, I think we might have defined this before, but, but what's the idea of mesh networking? Uh, what's kind of a, a way to explain that? Well, mesh networking eliminates centralized points of failure. The way things work now are you have routers and you have clients and basically you have, let's see how to explain it. Um, okay. You have all these clients and they need this access to the central gateway router in order to go anywhere. Well, if that centralized gateway router is taken offline for whatever reason, they can't get out of the local network that they're in. Mm -hmm. Now, a mesh network, it doesn't have to be every node, but lots of nodes on the network are also a gateway. And there are algorithms that will route the data intelligently through those gateways. And once, if one disappears, they will intelligently self-heal the network and route around it. So it just eliminates the, uh, you know, the, the centralized points of failure that you have with a network topology that relies on routers that only route to get you places. So, I mean, that's probably the easiest way I can explain it. So, so and, what, uh, what is, man, sorry to jump in again. So, so for, for those that understand, for those who understand cryptocurrencies, uh, would this be, would this be similar? And I guess a way for them to conceptualize this, uh, you know, uh, where, where, uh, like, uh, with, with the blockchain, 
um, you know, if uh, th there's there's no way for it to, to, to it's, it's immutable, right? Um, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain is immutable. You, you know, transactions can't be, you know, erased or manipulated. Uh, so would this be kind of similar where, uh, you know, even just uh, where, where the, the blockchain is stored on the individual kind of wallets when they just kind of update, like there's no way to actually take down the blockchain. Is that kind of the kind of similar only related to the, the more the more broad Internet? Yeah, sure. I mean, you're you're limited to the physical infrastructure that these um, mesh nodes are running on. But I mean, it it's much harder to take the network down if it's in a mesh configuration. But there's I mean, there's a lot of caveats to mesh networking, um, being that devices and nodes are going to come and go. Um, the type of, uh, you know, there's not, there can't be like a heavy, heavy security on who joins the network um, for it to be kind of like very, very, uh, a very widely used network with an, a lot of coverage. The more restrictions you put on devices joining, the less devices will join. Mm -hmm. Just stuff like that. Um, but, you know, you, the, the workaround to that is to do your security on higher levels. And, um, you know, basically instead of doing security, like for instance, regular wireless, you know, most people are using WPA2 and um, that does security on that level. And this would be a level above that, that where the security be done. Okay. So... Interesting. Interesting. So, so as far as, uh, so, so as far as, uh, what, what you're working on with mesh networking, it seems like the freedom boxes, uh, are, are, are very much kind of overlapping here. Uh, I mean, what, what specifically are you working on and what can the, uh, what can the listeners look forward to? And, and I mean, is there anything they can purchase now uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, realm? No, I'm trying to, um, save up for some R and D funds for this project. I have, um, I have some development boards picked out. I was all set on using a Raspberry Pi until I did a bunch of research on how secure they are. And um, they're not really, you know, for a project like this, they're not the right device. They have a lot of issues. They have a lot of firmware blobs that you can't look at. And there's mm. a lot of closed source stuff going on in them. So unfortunately, they are very inexpensive for the power they have. And um, the open source versions, uh, you know, open source development boards that actually have open source hardware are um, not quite as uh, feature full as far as as much as far as when it comes to uh, like processing power and memory sometimes. But they, um, they definitely have enough to do this job. Like one of the boards I'm looking at is called an Olinux Eno. A20, and um, it has two one gigahertz ARM ARM processor cores on it, and like I think 512 megs of RAM, and it has some cool things that Android that the uh, Pi doesn't have, like gigabit gigabit Ethernet, and um, it it can actually accept a SATA hard drive hmm. or a SATA SSD, just like a uh, desktop or laptop computer. And um, I believe it has USB 3 on it too. So, I mean, it has a lot more IO options as far as like high speed interfaces to connect it to stuff and build things out of it. But it has half the processing power of a Pi 3, let's say. Hmm, okay. But it's still, it's still more than enough to do these basic functions. Um, now, this, this stuff really isn't very new. I mean, people, there have been Linux distributions out there years ago that were, you know, centered around turning a desktop into a router like this, not with Tor, but you could do, you know, VPN and stuff with them. And, you know, that's kind of one of the things I got into Linux with is uh, using those uh, turnkey router distributions to, to turn like old Pentium 1s into like a network device. So this is a, uh, you know, this is just doing the same thing on these little development boards now that I was doing 15 years ago on like full size hardware. So 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 it's been it's been something discussed and worked on for some time. Uh, I mean, how 
obviously for for i i really do think for 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 these technologies uh especially for something like mesh networking or uh you know things along those lines they they kind of require upon you know uh people to adopt these technologies so so i guess a uh, two part question here uh i guess how how much has the how much progress has been made you know in the past you know 15 years uh since you've been working on them and second off i mean how 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 close are we to uh these being available to the average individual well really the most of the progress comes in the form of energy savings um small size um you know power for per watt and um just a, a, I don't know, a market that's ready for them, kind of. As far as the mesh networking goes, I wasn't really doing much mesh networking. That was, you know, most of the stuff at that point was wired that I was doing. But um, there's been a lot of development in mesh networking technology. There are multiple, there are multiple um, router schemes, um, like router algorithms that are competing for, you know, what, what's going to be the best one right now. There are a lot of uh, commercial offerings that are fairly expensive of good working mesh implementations. There's a lot of a lot of interest in it in the open source community for the reasons I was talking about. Right. Um, so, I mean, it, it is coming along pretty quickly. There, there's a really uh, decent project out there now that is will be separate from this. But um, it's called Broadband Hamnet, and basically it's an it's a mesh network that uh, was created by a bunch of uh, ham hackers, the people that are into radio and and computers simultaneously, that type of stuff. And um, it's it uses WRT routers, um, like a, actually I think it's just like the Linksys WRT fifty four G router a certain revision or a certain comp you know there's like a handful of revisions you can use but it's a functioning mesh network right now that if you fire one up and there is if there's another node within range of it it'll discover that node and you'll be hooked up wow so i mean there's a lot yeah there's a lot of stuff going on and i also you know i have a um a big box of those routers specifically to start messing around with that too um, but that's very specific but it's good because um, those routers are very inexpensive they don't take a lot of power um, there there's so much DIY stuff out there for making like waterproof cases and like solar panels and like all these things that you would need for a system like this that um, and there, there are still so many around, as well. Right, and and that's 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 really that's really really positive to hear because I I'll, 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 I'll the listeners might be surprised to hear this. Maybe I've alluded to it in previous podcasts, but I used to be kind of the sailboat guy. Like my my dream was uh, my dream and what I was you know working towards was uh, minimal sailboating. You know, I want to get on a boat and just you know float around international waters you know without government. Um, but they're like that's that's a lot harder to do than say van nomadism. So I've been looking a lot into uh, you know like van conversions uh, where you could yeah. where you could have them be completely self sufficient and uh, like it <laughs> and it, it's very very feasible and I can only imagine it, like I guess just just ponder this for a moment uh, for the uh, for for those listening. Imagine just like a, a van nomadic just uh, I guess uh, you know a lot of uh, you know Venuans take to van nomadism because it is it is pretty easy and it's cheap to do. Uh, it, it really is. It really is. But consider, you know, kind of like a uh, <laughs> a mesh network of uh, of van nomads, uh, you know, roaming around the United States. Like I, that's just really incredible. That's really cr like a it's a really crazy thought, but but one that you know I, I wouldn't mind seeing that uh, you know happen in the future. So as far as uh, these things being, uh, you know, I guess energy efficient, uh, it, it really wouldn't it really wouldn't be hard, especially with the uh, the affordability of, of uh, you know, solar panels with with as much power as you would need for, you know, a van uh, with all the things you would need, it really wouldn't take that much. So I, I think that's positive that uh, these things are becoming more energy efficient. Oh, yeah. Like one of these things, maximum power consumption is maybe 12 watts. So, right. it's, you know, a very cheap solar panel can provide that with a small battery for um, when the sun isn't shining. I mean, that's that's very, very little. 
I mean, that's like less than a suit, like a very high powered flashlight, you know? <laughs> right. Um, right. So, so I guess, um, I don't know how, how would, like, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of things as we're, as we're talking here. So how would, um, like, would there be like a, is, could there be a mobile mesh network like through, you know, a bunch of van nomads? Like, would that be possible? Yeah. And I'm actually, um, actually experimenting with some of that stuff. I have a, uh, I have a Ram 2500 like quad cab with a pop-up truck camper on it with 150 watts of solar, a couple hundred amp hours of battery. And um, it's basically my test bed for exactly what you're talking about. Did you have this set up at the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest? Yes. Damn it. I I should have taken the time to check it out, man. Yeah, I've been I've been working. We we're looking for a truck camper forever. You know, this has been something I wouldn't do for a long time. And then we found one. You know, the proverbial side of the road with the for sale sign on it, really cheap, and um, brought it home, used it as is for a couple you know campouts, and then I went and started tearing out stuff that was rotten and replacing it. And um, I installed the solar system, it replaced all the lights with LED lights. You know, just stuff like that. But it's with that, it's like a 150 watt panel. And when I get my, uh, I'm going to make a, a switch that I can jack the truck battery into that system too. And, you know, switch it on and off. But it'll be like 250 amp hours of battery capacity. And vacation this year, we, uh, we used it on the beach. And it was basically enough to power, you know, all the cell phones and stuff, um, two laptops, a, uh, I, I put a like 22 inch monitor in there with a raspberry Pi with Cody on it for an entertainment center. Right. It was enough to power that like, and the battery capacity never went down, you know, like below, uh, maybe 80% or something. Um, so yeah, it's it's not that expensive to do that. I think the solar panel was maybe a hundred thirty dollars shipped for a hundred fifty wow. watt. And see, I was um, I was I was putting together. I was I was watching these van conversion videos on on YouTube, and I didn't think we'd get into this tonight, but I'm enjoying it. Uh, I, I was watching like they they got you know maybe like a. Seventy five hundred dollars on a van. I mean, it was it like they. they I, I know what they did, and they 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 wanted you know kind of the the bones to be good. You know, they wanted a, a you know a, a deep like a, a good engine. They wouldn't have to worry about for a while, and then they just stripped out uh, the entire you know back end of that and spent five hundred dollars on materials. And uh, I'll tell you what, it's a lot more. I mean, it's 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 it looks slick. It's uh, functional. And uh, it's a lot better than uh, back in the 60s when Ray was talking. He's like, you know, if it, you can't say that the Vonnie living is expensive, just buy a be- bed truck and toss a mattress in the back. And that would be unattractive to a lot of folks. But you can, you can, I mean, you yeah. can live, uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, obviously very frugally in a, a nice living space uh, in, in the back of a van. And, and I was looking at, you know, okay, so solar panels, I mean, how much would this cost? And I guess I was way out of the range here. Uh, but I was, like the price I was coming up with on Amazon were like a thousand bucks. So so maybe it would be even cheaper. Maybe you do it for under uh, like if, if someone did want to go that route and buy like a used like 2007 or 2008, I guess kind of work van uh, for you know five to seventy five hundred dollars. Uh, maybe they could maybe you know the rest of it could be outfitted for you know less than ten grand. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, let me think how much I have into my solar system. I would say I have. 150 or 160 into the battery have like 140 some or maybe 150 including the actual mounts like the brackets to mount it to the roof into the panel then i probably have like 30 bucks in the cabling or and um the charge controller i think was like 25 dollars for one that will take two more of those panels if i want to add to it so really not that much Right. Yeah. No. That's... no I don't have an inver- I, I don't have a dedicated inverter in the system because I'm aiming to use mostly DC, you know, DC powered things. Mm-hmm. And with the ghost pads, I I have an option that you can get a power supply that runs either off a 12 volt DC or line voltage. Okay. So they plug right into an alternative energy system. That's without you losing that, uh, you lose so much 
converting from AC to DC. Yeah. 15% inverter loss or something like that. So it's all about efficiency. So you don't need as big of a system. Okay. So, so, so uh, for, for, for any, uh, you know, future van nomads out there, you could, you could run a ghost pad and your uh, you could run multiple ghost pads in your, uh, in your, uh, in your van. Uh, you know, the, the option for, for mobile mesh networking, and I want to get to that here in a moment. I mean, so, so, so potentially you could have that as well. I mean, this sounds like a really incredible second realm. Uh, and, and, and as Rayo kind of favored, and I'm, I kind of, t- I tend to lean in his favor or lean in, lean, yeah, lean in his favor that, you know, mobility is absolutely crucial. So, uh, you know what the coercers can't find, if the coercers can't find you, they can't coerce you. So, uh, I mean, this, this is all sounding uh, really, really interesting. Um, so I guess let's, I guess mobile mesh networking. I mean, how, how, it, and, and you kind of answered a little bit as far as uh, like the, that, that's kind of your testing bed, but. Uh, I mean, is that uh, extremely feasible? Like, could there be like a mobile mesh network rather than having to be uh, like with the the first realm infrastructure, with you know having to have that uh, that modem you know hardwired into the uh, into the cable? Uh, at least that's how it is for me. Um, I guess uh, would that be possible? Yes, eventually. I mean, it's going to take a lot of people doing it. I mean, you just just think of um, the line of sight your excuse me your wireless radio has for transmit and there has to be someone in that line of sight that is doing it too right um but i mean there's there are a lot of other ways to get um network access that aren't as uh above board though as well interesting you want to speak you want to speak to those opportunities just just, i'm I'm, I'm curious (laughs) Are you familiar with war driving at all? War driving. Can't say I've, I've, I can't say I am. Okay. Basically it's, um, you're recording, recording wireless access points and their GPS coordinates. So all you do is you like, and the ghost pads are set up to be able to do this is that you run this application that is monitoring Wi-Fi, and then it's spitting out that data to another application that is uh, recording the GPS coordinates and all the other stuff, all the details about the connections you find in a file. So, you know, kind of like how Google drives around to make the street maps in their cars. Well, people have been doing the same thing, mapping out wireless networks. And um, there's, you know, there's always ones that are open or ones that have weak security or ones that are just public. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's been a thing for a long time. And that, and that type of stuff is probably going to have a re- re- um, resurgence because of the uh, crack vulnerability that was just discovered on WPA2. Huh. I wasn't, I wasn't familiar. I mean, there's so many, so many of these things, so many of these things happen, you know, every single day with this terrible security, uh, or maybe just uh, maybe outdated, maybe something better is, 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 needs to, needs to come out if it's not already, but, but what happened, what happened with that? Well, basically, um, someone found a vulnerability that they can force it to use an old key Um, let's see how I can boil it down a little more understandable. Okay. In the past, the way you would attack a Wi-Fi network is that you would have to try to give, try to get the key. All right. Like, um, you would monitor the network and, um, there's this negotiation that takes place when a client jumps on the network. It's called the four way handshake. And if you recapture that and record it, you can take that to an offline cracking program and it will use a dictionary attack or use all sorts of ways you can do it. But usually um, people use a a dictionary attack to use the clues that are in that four-way handshake to figure out what the encryption, what the, you know, the uh, Wi-Fi key is. So this, you know, and then, you know, they'd find the key, they'd get on your network or they'd make themselves an evil twin. They would, you know, they would basically 
B, instead of your network you're connecting to, you'd be connecting to them and they'd be forwarding your information wherever, but they would be recording it and stripping out the encryption, uh, like yeah. the SSL. Um, but this vulnerability, it allows somebody to attack the clients and basically decrypt a lot of what the clients are sending out that is supposed to be you know, heavily encrypted through WPA2. And it's basically an attack that makes um, makes them be able to insert an encryption key. And basically it can, I believe it can even like make a zero key that like just says the key's all zeros. It's it's hard to explain. Um, but there's there's a significant vulnerability and, and this is, um... And that, yeah, this is something that would affect anyone that uses a WPA2. If if someone is trying to, if if someone's trying to, you know, I guess, uh, get into their system. So, um, I, I guess uh, what what's I, I'm always curious to see what the the I guess the manufacturers or I guess kind of the the tech world's response to these sorts of things. I mean, were, did they uh, you know jump on it real quick and fix the vulnerability? I mean, what what's kind of been the progress with that? If you if you if you if you know. Well, well, all the all the uh, all the big names did. They jumped on it. They actually were notified before the vulnerability was released to the public. So they had been working on patches and stuff like that. So most of the major major companies with devices have patched things or have a patch available. But the problem is, how we were talking about the Internet of Attack Vectors, a lot of those devices are never going to get patched. So a lot of those devices are now insecure even though they're using WPA2. So they're insecure nodes on your network that can be launching off points for other attacks once they're compromised. Okay, and, and to, to try to, I guess, maybe see if I, if I understand this and, and to put it in, in other words for the listeners. So, so for the, these, various, the, these various attack vectors, so, so like the, the major companies where, you know, this WPA2 encryption for these, for these routers and modems, if I'm understanding this correctly, um, you know, they got all that passion. That's, that's you know, that, that's good, uh, at least for the major ones. But for, um, I guess, the Internet of Things devices, those are insecure nodes now uh, that could be exploited uh, through, it, it could be, you know, I guess, exploited for, uh, you know, f uh, for, for security leaks or something. Is that kind of what, what you're talking about here? Sure, and there there are a lot of um, a lot of devices from the manufacturers that have, have released patches that are just not supported anymore. So that makes it even worse. Yeah. So you have all these devices that don't have any support because they were closed source to begin with, and you were you know you're stuck with that manufacturer to do anything with them. You have the devices that are just cheap imported stuff that are like no brand name or the they're the generic things that everybody slaps their own brand name onto well those companies aren't going to patch them you know for the most part um and a, a, you have things like phones and a lot of those things aren't going to get patched properly especially if they're old not out, out of date yeah and run an unsupported version of android or whatever so you know, you have all those old devices. It just made a bunch of old devices even more of a security risk. <sighs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so I guess the, the the answer to this problem is uh, is open source, right? Where where people can, uh, you know, and, and that that's one thing I, I I I really I really like about the open source. And I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but there there have been, you know, you know, uh, you know, issues raised with various open source programs and. They get taken care of pretty quickly, if not by the original developer. Uh, it's open source, so other people can do it. Uh, it's it's not uh, uh, so even if something is you know five years old, uh, some sort of program is five years old, those still get patched. Uh, and actually, I think I remember. I don't know if I don't know if this is actually open source. I'm not going to mention it, but uh, but yeah, I guess the answer to that would be open source, right? Yeah, I mean. It, it all depends on how much demand for the program to exist, too. There's a lot of open source projects that fizzle out and are no longer supported, too. But the thing with those projects is if you want, if you really want it supported, you could put money behind it and, you know, do a Kickstarter to get it up again if there's enough interest in it. And, have to, you know, if you can't code, you can have developers just, you know, okay, take this source code and update it. You know, make it new again. So you can't do that with a closed source you know, solution. 
Right, right. So, so we're we're about 45 minutes into this, and we haven't even gotten to the second portion. But I, I do want to get into, um, I guess one one I, I guess, okay. So so moving into permaculture here, you mentioned two other things uh, when we were when we were preparing for this, um, and uh, yeah, this is in, in regards to your developing your crypto anarchist work, which I found interesting. You know, alongside these other things like you have freedom boxes and mesh networking, then you have a weather station and irrigation automation and monitoring. So, tell us a bit about what you're what you're trying to do there, and obviously that re that re that relates to to what you're doing out there on your permaculture farm. Well, the uh, weather station stuff, it you know there are turnkey um, pie hats they they call them. They're basically boards that you know jack right onto the pie, and any other compatible the same pinout like a lot of these development boards have the same pinout on their expansion header so they can use pi compatible stuff and you don't have to use a pi but um yeah there's there's a bunch of mature product products out there and projects to just be able to roll your own weather station up and um you know you can either jack it into like a national database and or you can use it for um you know my my Wanting, what I want to do with it is I want to use it for um, site analysis. So you can have a weather station there. You can put it there for a year and you can graph what's going on there as far as the weather, the, you know, the barometric pressure, the temperature, the wind speed, the wind direction. I mean, there's even things that can measure sunlight and, you know, stuff like that. So it's a, uh, get into some of the um you know permaculture uh principles and um techniques like that's that's a big thing it's just observation and this can automate a lot of that observation and be more detailed than just kind of uh, eyeballing it right right yeah that's so, that's yeah i mean obviously yeah what's uh you know what's going on with the environment and the uh uh, and the weather obviously has a major impact on uh, on you know what what you might decide to grow next year if you know, or, or uh, you know uh, you know what you'll have to do to to make something uh, you know grow the following years. So, yeah, that 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 certainly makes sense. And and I suppose the irrigation automation and monitoring would, um, in some sense. So 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 kind of just just thinking thinking this through, um, maybe your end goal is. Uh, have that weather station feeding in constant information to the irrigation system that you have, maybe, you know, kind of uh, something that you rigged up so that uh, if uh, the weather station, you know, detects for uh, there's been no rain for three days, there's not going to be rain for three more days, uh, you know, go ahead and feed some water to these plants. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Well, basically, it can work off of um, moisture sensors for the irrigation part. Um, you could totally do what you're doing, what you're talking about too, but um, drip, ir drip irrigation with con that's controlled by uh, sensors, like moisture sensors in the soil where the, you know, where, where the plants are, is more what I was thinking for the irrigation control. And there's all, like, you know, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm I'm building a car out of wheels that are already there. So like right. it would be, you know, th these devices, um, there's no reason why it has to be just a weather station. It can also be, you know, it can also be a drip, you know, drip irrigation um, automation system as well, running on the same box. Um, just like uh, it could also be a mesh network node at the same time. Okay, so we're talking about kind of the same. You you could you could have uh, one of these uh, and and just say freedom boxes that could be running your mesh networking, or it could be you know just kind of your your VPN from your normal you know your normal modem or router, and it could also be your your weather station or irrigation controller or something along those lines. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and the weather stations that um, you know um, these are machines that are made to be outside, solar powered, battery backup waterproof cases up on poles basically um so you know that that's also kind of my idea for uh making mesh nodes so if each one of those is a mesh node um you just have that much you know that much greater chance of having a working mesh with more nodes basically 
Right, right. So, so, so I guess a question there for I, I'm starting to understand what how this how this these these mesh nodes would work. Um, I guess how much would how much would they cost for for the average individual, and could they come equipped with the the hardware to run a mesh node already? As far as the hardware needed to run the mesh node, I mean it's you know basically going to be a wireless radio. Um, most a lot of these development boards do have integrated wireless, but that's not really what we're looking for because it has a very limited range and very limited tweakability. Um, but adding mesh network capability to a, a, a box that's already doing stuff is as simple as buying a USB wireless adapter of the right type and, and the proper antenna for it. Okay. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and I guess how much, how much, how, do you have any idea on how much that would cost? Like if I, if I was going to do this tomorrow, how much, how much would that cost me? Um, now based on the pie, which is what I was doing all my research around before I decided to use something else. Sure. You, you know, the, you usually pay about $50 for a pie in a case. Um, I'm, I forget how much the uh, weather station hats are, but I mean, the goal would be as inexpensive as possible, you know, under a couple hundred dollars. It's, uh, is attainable. Um, when we're talking about the radio needed for the mesh network, you know, it's, it's a $25 part with a, you know, 20, $20 antenna. So, sure. you know, it's just, uh, it's really hard to say. I haven't really priced that stuff out because that's more in the future. Um, right now I want to get the, the basic freedom box things going and, um, in people's hands. And I have a, uh, another, another place, another site that, uh, I have friends doing permaculture farming and they're very much into all this stuff too. And, um, between my site and their site for testing, I want to hook them up and help them get started with monitoring and everything else. And of course, I mean, these could have surveillance cameras on them as well. I mean, it's a general purpose computer. It can do whatever you want. Right, right. Yeah, and I, I think, and that's, and I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this, as I'm sure you can imagine, being a, uh, um, not a tech illiterate, but at the same time, I mean, this is, this is, I've been looking into this for almost two years now, and it's still, there's, there's so much there, especially for someone not, pro, like not a programmer, a developer, a hardware hacker as yourself, but, I mean, it doesn't seem impossible that, you know, once, once kind of, once things get ironed out with, you know, the mesh node specifically, um, you know, have some sort of a, uh, you know, start pushing that out, uh, like all hell and, uh, maybe, you know, run some, some Kickstarters or go, go fund me's and, uh, you know, get, get a bunch of these purchased and then just send them out to people that would be, would be willing to actually get them hooked up. I don't know how many, how much, I don't know how, like how, how much the demand is for that now, but I can't, I can, I can certainly see, uh, a lot more, uh, a lot more folks in the anarchist community starting to care about privacy. So, uh, and obviously decentralization too. I mean, that's kind of been the thing with cryptocurrencies for a while. So I, I, I do think this has the legs to be something really, really incredible. So, um, I mean, that's seriously, seriously positive. I mean, that that's, I, and I guess one other question here that I thought of a moment ago, and, uh, I, I hope you have some time to my chain, and I, I didn't expect to talk about this for, for it'll probably be an hour by the time this is all said and done, but, uh, um, oh, man, I'm, I'm fine. The kids are watching a show with their mom okay good deal it's all good good deal yeah I, I i don't i obviously don't want to you know impinge upon uh uh anything going on going on there at home but so so as far as uh i guess one one argument made against cryptocurrencies and i think it's 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 a it's it's something that does need to be you know pondered and a solution needs to be to be offered or multiple solutions you know is this kind of sort of the free market but if the government, if, if there's, if the internet, if there's, you know, an internet kill switch, you know, in, in some countries where, you know, the, the governments have shut off the internet, um, you know, cryptocurrencies aren't going to have, aren't going to have much of effect there. Uh, so could kind of the mesh networking take over for, like, could it handle the blockchain uh, technology as well? I mean, is there any, any sort of development, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, combining, you know, mesh networking and kind of these uh, freedom boxes with uh, blockchain? Well, the, the, uh, um, the networking projects that I'm aware of that 
combine a blockchain with networking have been like um like namecoin that was uh you know a blockchain based dns system right right yeah so there that's i mean that's really important i mean you can have all these all these network nodes in a network but if they don't know what nodes what and we're you know they don't have any type of naming convention or anything to organize them and that's right now that's basically centrally managed and that's another that's another area that needs to be you know turned over to the second realm and there's there's a lot of stuff that is uh working around that so yeah i'm sure the uh a blockchain could be propagated by mesh network i don't know exactly how all that would work it'd be very very difficult i mean it would have to have something that's very widespread adoption and big enough to route around the blockages but um it's you know it's definitely something that's possible Right. Yeah, I mean that is the you know when if if the lights ever go out, you know crypto is probably not the best thing to have everything, and you should be divested in other stuff too. Of course, of course, yeah, 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 um, yeah. And there was uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. Uh, it was uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, it was uh, so so Michael Michael uh, Fien did a lot of he he worked he did some work with Namecoin and and you know that kind of uh, you know I guess that that project kind of failed to some extent. And uh, he tried to do something with, uh, I, I can't remember, uh, Bitcoin is the cryptocurrency, BIP, B-I-P as in Paul, uh, Bitcoin, and then, oh, why, why don't I, um, why can't I remember this? But it was, it was uh, you know, kind of that same name coin idea based off of the Bitcoin blockchain. Unfortunately, it didn't, unfortunately, the, you know, the, the, apparently there wasn't that much of a demand for it at this point. And, that, that, and that's something, too, I, I, I was talking to Kyle on a recent episode of the Vani podcast, and we were talking about... Um, actually, no, it was, it was here on Liberty Under Attack. God, I'm getting these things confused now. Uh, but uh, as I was talking about uh, how, you know, we've got, I mean, we've got, uh, we've got Monero, you know, we've, we've got these crypto note coins with, uh, and with, you know, these anonymous blockchains. I mean, why the hell isn't there a, an assassination market yet? And I'm getting ahead of myself. This technology hasn't been around for that long. I mean, e even when we're talking about mesh networking, I mean, probably no more than 20 years. And, and maybe I'm wrong about, about that, but that's still not a lot of time and a lot of developments have been made even just the past 10 years when it comes to crypto anarchism. So I, I think I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. And since I don't know how difficult it is to, uh, you know, program or develop, uh, well, I know it's difficult, but I, I, I'm not in, in, in their shoes. So I, I don't have a firsthand experience of that. And then also too, there are simpler problems that need to be tackled first. So simpler and easier problems that need to be tackled first using, you know, blockchain technology and other things. So, I think sometimes I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm seeing the potential for all of these technologies. And these things take time, right? Good things take time. Yeah, and I mean, the fundamental thing right now is to support open source when you can and to try to transition everything you're using to open source as much as possible because that's going to give it some momentum and um, you know, you're just stoking the forces of the market when you do that. Um, but yeah, you know, there's all these projects that are right on the cusp of, cusp of being, being, uh, viable. And it's just a matter of people trying them and using them to, uh, you know, give them the tests they need. Right, right. So, so I, I guess, I, I guess, uh, no better time to segue now, but I'll, I'll kind of just, uh, is there, do you have any other uh, thoughts on? Uh, I guess uh, the work that you're doing uh, or in regards to the crypto anarchism we, we've been talking about for the past uh, hour or so. No, that's fine. That's uh, I haven't really had any more things to talk about. <laughs> All right. And, and yeah, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I, I've learned, I've learned, Jamin, that, uh, you know, put together short outlines now because the, the amount of stuff, I, I didn't used to be good at interviewing people, and maybe some, some people don't think I'm good at interviewing people anymore, but, uh, but anyways, I, I always have a lot, of a, lot, a lot of questions on the fly, and I never, I, I never, I always used to have, I used to spend hours on outlines, and I'd only get to, like, touch on a quarter of it, so uh, I didn't expect to go into a lot of that stuff, but uh, certainly, certainly glad that we did, and it seems like the, what, what you're working on is very much in line with Van Nomadism, which, uh, even and, and and here we go again uh, with another I guess uh, a tangent, but uh, you know van nomadism or van dwelling is as as more commonly known. That is extremely popular. 
It is. Just go to YouTube and type in Van Dwelling. Like, this is not something that's outside of the realm of possibility, having, you know, mobile nodes with, uh, you know, on vans. Uh, now, sure, some of those folks may not have the same mindset about government that uh, that uh, Venuans or anarchists do, but at the same time, they're pursuing this lifestyle for a reason, uh, even though they may be a little, little bit controlled schizophrenic in some areas. So this is not outside the realm of possibility, what we've, or I guess what I discussed earlier with uh, with kind of the potential of, uh, of the vans. But uh, are you ready to move forward to permaculture farming? Sure. Hey y'all, Shane here. You love Amazon, don't you? You do a lot of shopping there, right? I think we all do. <laughs> well, one great way you can support Lip Under Attack is by doing all of your shopping through our Amazon affiliate link. It costs you nothing extra, and we get a cut. Getting ready to purchase a bunch of books on Austrian economics? A knife for your bug out bag? Bulk additions to your food storage? Make your purchase by first visiting libertyunderattack.com forward slash Amazon. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Amazon. And thank you in advance for your support. All right, so so Jamin, uh, I guess let's. It's, it's always best to start with the defi definition first, especially when it's something that I we really haven't discussed on this podcast yet. We we talked about it a little bit towards the end of uh, our last discussion, but uh, we haven't really had a, a you know a, dis a, a full discussion on it. So let's start with the definition first. Uh, what is permaculture farming? Well, permaculture is a you know the word permaculture is a combination of permanent and agriculture. And it's a design science that is aimed at producing very resilient and regenerative systems that are as self-sustaining as possible. So um, it's you know to it's centered around a handful of ethics or first principles and um, a handful of uh, design principles. And the uh, the ethics are simply earth care, people care, and return of the surplus. So basically, it's you know, I'm trying to explain it like um, it's it's saying that in order for it to function, you're going to have to have a level of empathy for the earth and the people that you're dealing with, and the people that are going to be you know using your system, and um you're going to have to make sure that you return enough of the surplus into the system to keep it sustaining. Now it, th there's, that's a pretty controversial kind of uh, take on the ethics. Not, I mean, that was kind of like the original idea. And then the third ethic of uh, returning, returning of the surplus was uh, basically turned into fair share by some people in the community. And uh, it has a very egal, you know, they use it as a very, very egalitarian principle versus, you know, they completely miss the point of what it was supposed to be. And, you know, if you look at it in context, it's everything has to get its fair share or else your system isn't going to work. Like you can't, you know, a lot, a lot of the, like the growing methods, you're actually growing soil. Like that is your number one priority is growing soil and then you get vegetables at the end. But your, you know, your chief motivation is to grow that soil so you can, um, you know, increase the organic matter and increase the fertility every season. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the, the basic ethics of it. There are 12 principles, pretty, pretty straightforward. One, you have to basically creatively use and respond to change. You have to observe and interact. You have to catch and store energy. You have to obtain a yield. You have to apply self-regulation and accept feedback. You have to use and revalue renewable resources and services. You don't want to produce any waste. You want to design from patterns to details. Um, you want to integrate rather than segregate use small slow solutions instead of doing a lot at once and use use and value diversity and use edges and value the marginal so basically mm. you know the way it all works together and like the practical application of it are finding systems that will work off the waste 
of another system you have or finding systems that will obtain a yield in place of a system that doesn't. So it's, uh, you know, it's always trying to keep those things in mind when you're doing your design. It's very much trying to find harmony with what you're doing and what will grow there and um, what the site is suited for. It's, you know, strengths and weaknesses. And a lot of that is through the observation. And, um, you know, that's what some of the automation stuff I'm talking about would be very good for is to uh, be able to automate some of that observation and actually be a lot more accurate than just the, the eyeballing that normally gets because, you know, we can't just stand there 24 hours a day recording all this stuff. Of course, of course. So, 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 so yeah, I mean, the... What, what's most attractive to me about permaculture, and I mean, obviously, I, 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 I certainly understand, I mean, you know, limiting, you know, you know, having no waste and having all of that be being a, a byproduct to, uh, you know, increase, increase the, the necessary nutrients in the soil to, you know, to, to produce a higher yield the next year. Um, I guess the part, the part that I'm, I'm most, I guess the, the point that really attracts me is, um, I'll, I'll tell you what, man, with just an organic garden in the backyard, I mean, it's, it's with just, I mean, it's uh, what, what is it? A seven, seven by two garden, maybe seven by two uh, container garden. And it's, uh, I mean, that, that takes some work, man. You got to go in there and you got to go in there and, and, and weed it. You got to, you know, de weed every single day. Uh, it seems like uh, got to, uh, you know, com, you know, consistently water and all of that. And it, I mean, I, I think I spent, I think I spend more time on my garden than, than, than you spend on your permaculture, your, your permaculture farm. Uh, for, you know, at least in regards to our last conversation where you said, hey, I only spent about a half an hour, you know, maintaining it every single, uh, you know, every single morning. I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty incredible, right? So, uh, yeah, was, was I mean, that, especially uh, you know, for a lot of the plants that yield a lot of uh, nu nutrition and a lot of the s systems that yield a lot of nutrition, they're not very, very hard to uh, manage. It's not, not nearly as time consuming as what, excuse me, people would you know, think about growing your own food. Um, you know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of it is engineering out the work. It's a very lazy way of gardening. You know, it's, it's all like, you know, I don't want to pull weeds every day. So I'm going to figure out how I can make no room for weeds and what plants to put together and what weeds to let grow and go to seed that are actually useful like, for instance, the mm -hmm. way we do things is that we have a handful of plants that you know, most gardeners or farmers would consider a weed, but they, we actually get a decent yield out of them. So we let them go to seed. We let them spread everywhere. So when we're out moving the plants that don't belong where we're growing our, like, um, intensive annuals and stuff, you know, it's, it's not wasted labor. We're either we can eat those, we could feed them to our animals. And at the, at the very least, we can make compost, which is, you know, excellent soil out of them. So it's all a matter of, of course, um, yeah. designing things in layers so that there's no space for undesirable plants to basically wreck everything. Now, there, there are still problem plants that you're going to come up with, you know, come up against that are very challenging. But using these methods, you can still use a lot less resources. I mean, I'm talking less water for irrigation, less energy with um, maintenance, even uh, less energy planting and harvesting. Like one of, the, uh, one of the great methods for growing a lot of calories in a small space that we employ is using no-dig potato beds or lazy potato beds. Now, all you do there is you can you can either buy straw we can we can get large bales of hay like the the large round bales that farmers use that are like 600 pounds or something we can get the we can get those for maybe uh, right, 30 right, yeah. bucks here one of those bales of hay is enough to feed animals for quite a long time and at the end of the end of the winter the hay that's um, rotted and started to compost there's enough there to um, 
make a no dig potato bed, which is basically um, one way you can do it is you can just take lawn, just the part that, you know, a patch that's lawn right now, mow it down. A mulching mower is best, so you mulch the grass right on top of there for more organic matter and um, grass, you know, grass has a very favorable carbon to nitrogen ratio and it'll act as a compost activator. And it's also, you know, will uh, encourage worms and have, you know, more food for earthworms. But anyway, so you would put that down. You would put down a small amount of whatever fertilizing soil amendment you're using. It could be compost. It could be manure. It could be um, um, like... Uh, like, you know, rock dust and, you know, the, the different fertilizer mixes you can, organic fertilizer mixes you can get. Now, what we do is we take the the waste product or the output from our rabbits and for about maybe, a, I don't know, maybe a hundred square feet, I'll use like one, you know, maybe six cubic foot wheelbarrow full of rabbit manure. And um, so you put the manure down, you put down okay. a layer of cardboard you put the rest of the manure on top of the cardboard and you can just basically plant. You place the seed potatoes in a hexagonal spacing right on there and you just start throwing mulch over top of them. Um, like with the hay. And what we do is we actually grow plants that they're, one of their main purposes is to be used as mulch and compost. So right by our where we grow our potatoes, we grow a plant called right. comfrey. And it's like, it's one of these miracle plants that has a thousand and one uses. But one of the uses is for making very, very high grade liquid fertilizer. It, you know, it basically pulls up a lot of nutrients from the subsoil and it has a lot of, it has a very favorable, you know, nitrogen to carbon to potassium um, and uh, potash. You know, it has a lot of good stuff in it. And it grows like crazy. It uh, you can cut it multiple times a year down to the down to the root, and it'll just come right back. You know, ours ours gets like five feet tall. So anyway, we have that growing right by where we grow the potatoes. So after I put that first layer of hay down, I go and cut about you know three or four big comfrey plants down, and I put a layer of comfrey leaves. And then if I have any other what we call compost plants growing in the area that I can, you know, we let thistles grow because they're very good at uh, amending the soil and actually breaking up the soil too, because they have a long tap root. So with this year, we use that one wheelbarrow of um, rabbit manure. Um, all the um, Canadian thistle that was growing nearby, and not, when I say nearby, within like a, you know, 50 square foot place where we were gonna plant the potatoes, and um, the contents of maybe three large car fruit plants and the leftover hay from last year. And um, it probably took maybe two hours to do. And you walk away from it and then you come back at the end of the year when it's harvest time and you, you peel the straw and hay back from wow. where your potatoes were growing and it looks like somebody dumped bags of potatoes there. That's yeah, that's that's incredible. That's that's wow. <laughs> I'm I'm trying just trying to absorb this and 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 figure out how some of this could apply to uh, here where I am or here where I will be in in uh, southern Illinois, and um, that's you know that's that's crazy. And I I do remember a couple of years back I didn't do this last year or I didn't do it this year for for some odd reason, but um, I planted uh you know basil and some some other other herbs like that, not necessarily to harvest, but just to act as uh, I guess, uh, you know, natural ways to keep weeds away. Um, so I think maybe I was doing that a little bit back then, but I, I, I stopped doing it. Maybe that was the reason I was so angry this year when I had to go out and, you know, de-weed every single day. But, but regardless, I mean, that, that's minimizing the work, right? And, uh, spending an, you know, an hour and a half or two hours and you're getting all those potatoes. That's, uh, it's pretty, pretty insane, pretty insane. So I guess what other, um, what, I guess, Oh, I'll jump to this question here now. Um, as I as I mentioned to you before, I mean, I do plan on homesteading and or uh, homesteading and permaculture farming in Southern Illinois. Uh, I guess how it's 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 pretty daunting considering I don't really have a whole lot of experience with this. I mean, where should I start? Uh, do you have any any you know uh, any advice on that? Oh sure. Um, 
Well, what you want to do is you want to grow soil. Wherever you are, you want to grow soil. So the best way to do that is to import as much organic matter as you can. Now, compost is expensive. Buying bags of compost and manure at the uh, at a, you know, Lowe's or Walmart or whatever, wherever you're going is relatively expensive. But there are a lot of waste products that you can use to you know, insert a lot of carbon at once and at the same time make it more of a blank slate by getting rid of what's there. So one of the things we do is a combination of sheet mulching and raw mule wood chips. Now sheet mulching is a generic term for when you take um, large sheets of something that's uh, something that will decay and rot in compost, but you put that directly on top of where you're going to grow and you don't, you basically, it's a no dig method. Okay. So like for instance, cardboard boxes, you can cut up cardboard boxes and arrange them. So there's one or two layers of those with no gaps. And um, there are various ways you can hold them down. Um, the best way is to get some, get, you know, call your local tree service people and see if you can get some loads of uh, wood chips. Because a lot of times, if, if you're not in a place where people use the wood chips for different things, they have to pay to get rid of them even. Right, right. Or, yeah. or they have to drive a long way from the site to go to dump them. And if you, if there's a crew working, you know, with, in your area, and they would much rather just, you know, drive five minutes to your house and dump them there than 20 minutes into town um, to dump them and, you know, even make a couple bucks on the, th on the transaction, you know, 30, 50 bucks is not a lot of, a lot of money to pay for a, uh, a triaxle dump truck full of wood chips. And that's, we've paid as little as that for a triaxle full. So, right. and the, uh, the wood chips you get from the tree service are much better than the mulch you buy because they're the whole ground up tree. They have all the nutrients in the leaves, the bark, and the, uh, the high carbon content of the wood. So basically, if you can score a couple, a dump truck or two full of wood chips for cheap and just have wood chip, perpetual wood chip piles at your place and just constantly be on the uh, on the prowl for more wood chips you can import a lot of organic matter without spending a lot of money and it's not really all that labor intensive after you get it done we did most of our sheet mulching with a couple couple like eight cubic feet wheel uh, wheelbarrows but a uh, a little garden tractor with a dump cart on it is a really cool tool for that yeah, I've got. Yeah, my my dad has a, a Kubota on the property right next door. So oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, it's got it's got the dump on it, and yeah, it's it's got. I guess what he uses to level rocks on the back. I don't know what it's called. I'm not. You know, I, I've done some. I've done a lot of stuff in the country, but I don't know all the, oh, all okay, the specific probably, terms. But yeah, uh, the, like the grader or something. Yeah, yep, grader blade. So yeah, it, so yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't take long to get uh, and. It, yeah, it, it wouldn't take long. I posted a picture of, of where I would do this on the on uh I posted that on uh on, on actually the LEA page and yeah, my I, I saw page. That. Yeah, so so the the left side where where the the picture that you saw will be where you know my zones for the permaculture farming will go in, and there's another side on the right where I'm going to you know fence that off. I'm an, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the one of the only yak farmers in Illinois. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and then there's a chicken coop that the 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 guy the the people lived there before forever. Um, they had a chicken coop. I mean, it, they didn't really do much with it towards the end because the, uh, the 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 um, the, the the guy had uh, some sort of leukemia or something. And before he got leukemia, in, in that area that I'm gonna be, be farming on, he was they were ready to have a big ass garden. So he did a bunch of work on that. So I need to get a soil tester and just see what the levels are at because he might have done a lot of that work for me to begin with. I mean, sure, there's a lot of grass on it now because it's been five years, but still, I mean, he knew what he was doing. So maybe, maybe a lot of that work's already done for me. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Well, here, here's something that's a lot different from a lot of conventional thinking. I've never gotten a soil test done. Basically, if you 
if you are using these techniques, you're going to create excellent soil. And um, a, a lot of this, the soil test methodology and reasonings come behind, you know, come with a uh, overemphasis on macronutrients in the soil and um, stuff like pH. But really, if you have um, if you have healthy soil, it doesn't really matter so much what the pH is because there's going to be pockets of the soil and parts of the soil that are different pHs, like different levels of the soil will be different pHs. And you can, right, you right. can control that just by the, uh, the methods you're using. Like, for example, this Romeo wood chip method that I'm talking about that's crossed with sheet mulching, you use the cardboard as an exclusion mulch and weed barrier layer and you dump the wood chips on top of the cardboard and if, you know, it's a very good idea to have like um, some bags of finished compost and uh, manure and, you know, so, some, or, um, you know, something nitrogen containing to act as a catalyst to rot that stuff quicker. But what's going to happen is the, uh, the cardboard, and that's going to be a great, um, basically great worm habitat. So it's going to attract earthworms that want to live under there because of it's, been, mm -hmm. it's going to retain moisture. Um, it's going to get the molds and bacterias and stuff on the, that grass that you left behind that I was talking about, like use a mulching mower and, and um, you can put a lot of like green organic matter under the cardboard. So, right. so what's going to happen is you're going to have all those worms doing a lot of the work of, into the subsoil and breaking up your subsoil for you. And while they're breaking it up, burrowing into it, they're also releasing nit um, nitric acid, which basically breaks down the um, organic nutrients and inorganic things so they're able to be used by the plants. So it's sometimes it's not a matter of just, you know, piling more nutrients on, it's making the nutrients there available. So what that's going to do is it's going to have layers of pH even. Your top layer with the wood chips is likely going to be slightly acidic because of it's going to be fungally dominated. The fungal dominated soil is slightly acidic and a fungal dominated soil would be like more like a forest floor. Okay. Versus like a prairie. You know, a prairie is more of a bacterial dominated soil. And um, that usually has like a, a lower pH you know, on the, on the base side. So when you're, when you're doing these methods, you're going to have uh, pockets of soil that are acidic and pockets of soil that are, you know, base and the roots can find their way to them. Um, so like a lot of the thinking, you know, a lot of the thinking on soil science that's being taught is kind of, uh, it's kind of antiquated compared to advancements in understanding of soil microbiology. It's way more important to get the right soil microbiology going than it is to add um, macronutrients. Okay, interesting. Like, for instance, there are certain mushroom species you can use to aid the decom decomposition of the wood chips and the cardboard while it um, does other positive things for the soil, just like I was saying how the... Uh, nitric acid makes things more available. So do the acids from the, uh, from the fungus. And some of those funguses produce edible mushrooms as well. So it's, you know, it's, you know, stacking functions. I'm going to put, you know, I'm using this method because it's so much less labor when it, after you get it started, you know, it's, you know, pushing around wheelbarrows upon wheelbarrow full of wood chips can be labor intensive, especially if you're like where I am and you're going up hills with them. But you know what? That's that's like um, that's like money in the bank as far as creating soil. You're putting so much organic matter there, and then if you put some type of catalyst, like a uh, like wine cap mushroom spawn or an oyster mushroom spawn in there, and it's eating that stuff up quicker, along with all the other mushrooms that are going to pop up. You know, there's all sorts of good soil builders that are going to pop up 
and it's basically going to transform that dirt into soil underneath. Like it's, yeah. I mean, it even, um, it even makes it loose and, uh, friable is the term where it's, uh, where like, for example, we live where there's mostly heavy clay, our whole yard and garden area in the yard, which is our whole yard is a garden. Basically it's heavy clay. There was maybe two inches of topsoil that you would call topsoil that was a little bit loamy at the max, at the deepest places. And the rest was like hard yellow clay. Do, um, we sheet mulched the entire perimeter of the, our half acre fence that we put in and um, planted uh, compost crops on top of the sheet mulching because you know, you, you're, you're basically mimicking a natural, a natural escalation of what, what would happen. You know, like you would have a tree fall and then the fungus would eat the tree and that would make soil and you'd have these plants that pop up in the soil and, but you can control which ones you put. So for example, we use a bunch of, um, legumes, which are like pea family, bean family plants that consist of clovers and alfalfas and beans and peas and mm -hmm. a bunch of lesser known plants that actually take act, they have a uh, beneficial relationship with the bacteria that lives on the root nodules and their roots that will actually let them take nitrogen out of the air and put it back into the soil. So they're actively fertilizing while they're growing. And then right. once once you chop them down and let them lay there, it's called chopping and dropping that, uh, you know, there, there was more, they put more nitrogen in than what they take by far. And so for your, your instance, what you're talking about, I would say cardboard, whatever veg, you know, whatever green matter you have underneath the cardboard, then cardboard, um, wood chips, with whatever amendment you can get, you know, it might be like mushroom compost, which is a decent amendment that you can get it by the truckload cheap. Like a pickup truck full of mushroom compost is like 20 bucks. And that will be a catalyst that will help, you know, everything, everything do what it's supposed to. So you put that, yeah. that on, um, and then you seed directly into that with a cover crop mix of legumes. And, um, that's part of how we, how we make sure there's no space for weeds. We want that, we want that like carpet of legumes, carpet of different types of clovers in there before weeds have a chance to uh, take hold. We want them to occupy right. that space because they're actually going to benefit the other plants growing around them. So that would be my, I mean, that would make you soil probably the quicker than anything else. And it doesn't involve a lot of backbreaking work, tilling or turning soil. At the most, if you have heavy clay, if you take a uh, garden fork and just aerate it by stabbing the soil, just step on it and stab it and step on it and stab it. And I, uh, under the area you're doing just so it has uh, some aeration because those holes will basically fill up with that organic matter eventually. And it'll also allow some air into things. And, you know, the, the uh, type of microorganisms you want are aerobic. The anaerobic stuff is, you know, the stuff that isn't good for soil. That's what waterlogged soil has in it and why things rot, you know. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah. So basically you would, you do all that and um, seed those um, cover crops in. And then once those cover crops are up or even shortly before they're up, you could seed some annual plants and depending on what you're, what you put on what's underneath there, like what plant you covered up, you can go right through the cardboard into the subsoil that's there, you know, with a sharp, you know, you can sharpen a garden, uh, like a hand garden spade and go right through it and plant into the soil. Or if you have something under there, like uh, Bermuda grass, that as soon as you put a little hole for light, it's going to just take over the place. You can plant directly on top of there by moving the wood chips over just a little bit and making little mounds of compost in soil. You know, you know, I'm talking very minimal investment in input. So you can plant directly in those little mounds, your, your annual plants. And um, you, you might get, 
a, uh, a reduced yield the first year because that whole process needs a lot of nitrogen to do what it's doing and it's it could make your plant stunted but like i said you're you're growing soil first and you're growing vegetables second especially your first year or two and so what that'll also do is since you have all these plants there and there's not a lot of space between plants and if you're using techniques like companion planting where you're not just growing big blocks of one type of plant it will um the predator to pest ratio will begin to self-regulate without applying any pesticides, organic or otherwise. Like a lot of times people will have a bad, you know, they have a bad taste in their mouth because they decided they're going to make a garden somewhere one year and they don't realize that they're basically bringing all this alien stuff into this, th this place and there isn't, a, there isn't a balance there yet between predator and prey when it comes to insects that uh, a lot of time a pest insect will be overrepresented because it, the, you know, there is no reason to have a healthy predator population there. You know, they're like, for instance, a, like a broccoli worm. Broccoli worms are the bane to anybody who grows broccolis and cabbages and stuff like that. Well, when you first put a... Uh, a a cabbage or broccoli or cauliflower or whatever that you know coal crop patch in there you're probably going to get a broccoli worm infestation well that's because the broccoli worms predators don't know that that's where it should look and since it's the ideal food mm. source for that moth that moth is going to lay a bunch of eggs and their population is going to skyrocket because they're eating all your stuff and they found a good place to be well you the the best way to um you know rebalance that situation is to encourage the predators that eat the moth larva to patrol that area and the way you do that is you you plant plants there that attract them and another way you can do it which works really well especially in this in, this uh, this instance and it's why I use it as a an example when talking about this because it works well for us is that paper wasps um they one of the main food source for their larva are these like broccoli worms and caterpillars like that and so all you have to uh, do okay so you encourage the paper wasps which really aren't that aggressive unless you fuck with them they're not hornets hornets will nail you yellow jackets will nail you just because the paper wasps, I really, you know, unless you step on one or like you brush up against one or, you know, one's flying by you and you, you know, some people like try to, you know, you know, swat them away. It's like the worst thing you can possibly do. Just let them go. You know, they're really beneficial. What, what they'll do is you can get them to start patrolling it. And one of the ways you do it, first you get those, those companion plants in there that draw them around and then you hand pick the broccoli worms off your plants and you squish them and you put them right on top of the leaves where it's very very evident from something flying over that it's on there so they begin to rot and smell and they're in an obvious place so these wasps that are flying around to get the nectar of these plant these flowers they like notice them and then they just start patrolling it for you then you'll just see five and six right. wasps patrolling your broccoli patch like little drones, decapitating caterpillars and bringing them back to their larva, or you know, or or they'll lay their eggs in the caterpillar parts in their little the cells of their uh, their wasp you know paper wasp nests whatever you call them. Right, right, yeah. So 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 utilizing uh, you know natural natural defense, you know, uh, uh, plant like uh, as I said uh, what I what I did a couple of years ago. Putting in kind of uh, I guess natural uh, natural pesticides and or I guess natural herbicides in that instance, um, just utilizing these these natural ways to keep pests out of the garden, uh, out of the farm, uh, and I think that's uh, you know really you know really terrific. I, I I used to I used to be really really into the organic thing, um, kind of you know it it got it got when I it got pretty expensive. I had a really good job a, a few years back and I, I could afford it, but then I I really couldn't too much. Um, so I kind of got out of it a little bit, but still, you know, limiting the, the external, uh, I guess, 
chemicals on on the uh, on on the farm i think is a, always a positive thing to do i guess on, on that note so uh, do you guys use any you know pesticides or herbicides on uh, on your permaculture farm no um we about the only things we've used are um neem oil which we really don't use much of it we didn't use any this year and um there there are other things you can do to help your help your plants be more pest resistant like one thing you know a lot of pests will only attack weaker plants it's just like you know the you know attacking the weak member of the herd well certain nutrient deficiencies attract pests um for example like there's a flea beetle that is really bad for like potatoes and um uh, like eggplant and it could even be like tomatoes and stuff and if you plant those plants in a place that isn't favorable to them, you'll get, there's, there's a good opportunity to get infested by them. If you plant them in a place that is well amended with a lot of organic um, amendments and like a diverse compost and like what I'm telling you with the, uh, the Romeo wood chips and cardboard and everything, there's a lot less chance of them having a nutrient deficiency and, um, being targeted by these these pests so an another thing you can do is and this is this is more for uh molds and funguses but it also works for other pests too because you make the plants stronger is you can brew compost tea and foliar feed compost tea with a sprayer on your plants not only does it feed your plants through you know you know foliar feedings feeding through the leaf through the foliage it go you know it soaks into the pores and it gets the nutrients that way instead of the roots and gets a lot more but it's also creating a favorable habitat on that for the right types of microorganisms that you want on there so that's that's another method that's common that's that's a method that's used a lot in permaculture in organic orchards that they don't spray they have different compost tea mixes they use and they spray their plants with that and it protects against a lot of the uh, blights and funguses and um, makes stronger plants that are less susceptible to infestation and everything else. So, I mean, there's also... Right, so, so, so let me ask uh, yes, let, let me ask this question just as kind of a comment, like uh, I guess as something complete, the complete opposite of permaculture farming. Uh, just, you know, just, I guess, general agriculture today where... Uh, the the most they'll, they'll they really do and and I know this from personal experience is they'll they'll grow corn one year and soybeans the next and 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 hope that you know they can you know feed back some of those nutrients back into the soil. Do you think the the need for all of these herbicides and pesticides is generally due to the fact that um, you know they aren't using the methods that permaculture farmers do and I guess I guess uh, doing it naturally. Do you think the the, the need for why there's industries you know, grown up around uh, pesticides and herbicides. Do you think that's a factor of, of, of the farming methods? Oh, for sure. Um, a lot of it has to do with monoculture as well. I mean, when you have a huge, huge block of plants that are all the same kind and that are all susceptible to the same type of pest infestation, you get a little bit of that pest infestation there and it spreads like wildfire they it's very easy for them to see your plants it's very easy for them to reproduce and multiply in, in a place that's just like you know acres of food for them so um not having big monocultures to begin with is a uh, is the key to not using not having to use pesticides and um you know, even even herbicides, because these monocultures, they just want this one plant to grow and they kill everything else. A lot of pests, there are companion plants that are called trap crops. There are plants that the pests like more than your food crop that you can grow with your food crop, and it will trap those pests and they'll eat that. And, they'll you know, it'll still encourage the predator population to come get them and everything else, but they're mostly off your plants. One of the one of the quote unquote weeds that we let grow is an excellent trap crop for a pest called a leaf miner. And there's these little insects that basically uh, destroy plant leaves. 
um, they eat little lines through them. But uh, they prefer this lamb's quarters, which is the plant, they prefer it to a lot of the other plants in the garden that they would eat if that wasn't there. So that's one of the plants we let grow. It's a wild spinach. You can you can use it like spinach. You can feed pretty much any animal from a chicken to a rabbit to a pig will eat it. And it's a great trap crop for these leaf miners. So that's, you know, that's another strategy is just, uh, you know, finding food that is more favorable to them and growing that there too, to keep them off your main crop. Um, another uh, thing too, deterrent, deterrence. Yeah. yeah. And another, another thing with uh, just permaculture farming in general is that, you know, people have been um, convinced by marketing for a long time that you, everything you eat has to be fit for sacrifice to a God or something. It can't have any spot or blemish on it. It can't, um, you know, it can't look like a real piece of food that was grown in a uh, natural system. It has to be, you know, you know, an apple can't have a, have a, uh, little bite from an insect taken out of it, for example, or a, uh, I know examples are kind of fleeting me right now, but I think you get my point that it, uh, yeah, if, if, if it doesn't look, a, a, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. If it has, if it has the, the, the smallest sort of, um, uh, you know, sign that, uh, oh, this may be bad when, you know, oh, it, it, it looks like it may be bad. Therefore, we're just going to throw it out, uh, that, that sort of thing. And it, it really used to be quite the opposite. I mean, people would expect a certain amount of damage to their food crops and just say, well, that's, you know, that's the price of paying, you know, doing business is the price of growing food is that there's other things that are, that are going to uh, take a bite here and there. Um, and that's not really bad. That actually encourages the predators to those things to multiply as well because they have a good food source. So as long as it's kept in check, I don't need to have all my food, you know, fit for sacrifice to a god or something. It it can, you know, my apples can have a uh, irregular shape to them, or there can be a uh, little bit of damage to my kale leaf or something. It doesn't have to be pristine and, uh, you know, photo worthy food all the time. And like I said, it used to be where people would not only expect that they would think something's wrong with your food. If none of your food had any, any sign of, uh, you know, insect damage. Cause it's not normal. That's not how, that's not how food should be. It's, uh, you, you've done something to that food to make not even insects want to eat it. And that's, uh, it's kind of sketchy, right? <laughs> right. It, it, exactly. And, and I, I, I think honestly, and this is something that I, I've talked about, especially in the food storage episode that Kyle and I did for the Vani podcast. I mean, is, I think that's really just a sign of the culture. I, I think that's 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 kind of what it is. You know, back in uh, you know the the mid the mid twentieth century, when I mean, like going to a grocery store for all of your food that was unheard of. That didn't happen. So I I, I certainly imagine I I would certainly you know, I guess postulate that uh, what you're saying here, like oh you know what uh, you know an animal took a bite out of this or you know a, a bug took a bite out of this, you know still good to eat. Um, I, I think that's also kind of a sign, like uh, a sign of the culture, as I said, where oh, well, you know, this doesn't look perfect. I'll just go. I, I can always just go buy more at the grocery store. I think it might be might have something to do with the mindset. Yeah, and I think a lot of that mindset was engineered. You know, it, coincidentally, that mindset came about, you know, shortly after the age of um, mass media, and. Um, you know, shortly after the age of incorporating modern psychology into um, marketing and um, propaganda. Right. I mean, there was a big push to get people off the family farms and into the cities. So, you know, you have these derogatory terms like hillbilly and, you know, whatnot of, you know, people, you know, country bumpkins and the media would, you know, basically uh, portray these people as backwards and, you know, retarded and everything else. And um, it was like, yeah. And, and de demonizing survivalists and preppers. Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and this is like in the, you know, the turn of the 20th century, you know, like with when, when they were trying to push, you know, it, you know, the first real kind of the first test drive of that whole, you know, integrated propaganda methods they were coming up with was transforming a pacifist 
country into a country that said, okay, we're going to send our sons and daughters to die in, you know, the, the wastelands and trenches, you know, and, uh, right. You know, that propaganda machine just kept rolling after that. Right. And let, let me, let me ask you a question kind of, kind of based off this line of thought. Um, if you look at kind of the family farms, they, they needed like the, the reason they had a lot of kids, uh, I guess one of the reasons was because they need a lot of people to work on their farms. Right. So do you think kind of that push towards uh, towards uh, urbanization uh, was, I, I guess, in large part so that, uh, you know, well, well, we don't we don't we don't need them here at home. So, yeah, you know, send them overseas. That's cool. Do You think that had anything to do with it? Yeah, I think it had a lot to do with it. I think. uh um, you know, and it's it's no coincidence that it's you know the century of mass schooling is what was happening at the same time. So, you know, we had the the Prussian school system imported around you know the time of the early twentieth century progressives, let's say the early twentieth century progressive era, and um, right. then they also had all these new psychological um, propaganda methods that were pioneered by. You know Freud's Freud's nephew, uh, Bernays, and yep. um, they just you know they had the they had the mass media to basically beam their thoughts into everybody's head through the radio and then later TV, and so they were able to basically uh, you know like Plato's you know like Plato's cave they were basically able to fool people with shadows on the wall, and um, the push to you know, move out of the countryside into the city to populate the assembly lines was, I think, I think a lot of that was engineered. And um, I think a lot of the self-sufficiency was um, looked down upon at that time because it was counter to that narrative. You know, they, right. they wanted cogs for the machine. They didn't want, you know, a lot of farmers were polymaths. I mean, they, they do a lot, they did a lot of stuff. They didn't just, they weren't just dumb hicks. You know, they, uh, they were, a lot of them were very intelligent people with a wide skill set that could pretty much do anything they needed to do to, you know, have a productive and happy life. And that's very much. Exactly. And that, and that kind of, that, 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 that goes right along with, sorry, sorry to jump in again, but, um, that goes right along with down where I'm looking at, well, down, down where I'm planning on, you know, moving to in, in Southern Illinois is. I, I mean, I mean, yeah, you, 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 the city folk would, you know, look down upon them. But these individuals, they, 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 they've, they've learned these tasks on the farm growing up, whether it's welding or farming, you know, uh, or wh whatever it may be, uh, you know, plumbing or uh, all of these really necessary trades. I mean, they just, they just kind of learn those. They're extremely smart individuals. They just, you know, chose to live in the country and they never moved out of it. And uh, another thing that I, I talked about with Jason Booth on one of the episodes of the Vonnie podcast is a, a really, uh, you, you know, another benefit of, you know, the state uh, corralling individuals into cities is uh, if, if everyone's and if, if, uh, if, if the majority of the population is one place, they're easier to control. Oh, exactly. So I, I think I think this 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 all kind of goes hand in hand. It's a weird, weird turn, but it, it, it certainly is related uh, when you look at uh, the. The industry that's being created around agriculture, I mean, it kind of go, it kind of goes right along with that. It, it, and, and then, and then also too, you you consider like the the corn syrup revolution. I don't like calling it that. I don't like that. I don't like that terminology. And I don't know if that's actually how what it's called. But I, I really do think that, um, you know, with big ag agriculture the way it is today, there's no way that could have happened without. Uh, you know that major those major subsidies. Oh yeah. Uh, you know from the state, so it's it, it's all it, it it's it's all backwards. It it, it really is. It, it's all backwards. And well, modern agriculture. I mean, the, the state's involved in all of it. I mean, the modern mechanized agriculture didn't become it didn't become what it is until you know after World War One, where all these companies were tooled up to make these death machines and tanks and um, chemical weapons. And they needed to find, you know, it's the uh, iron law of bureaucracy. They needed to find a reason to exist. So they turned their machines into farming machines. And they were the same companies that started to build like tractors and everything else. And um, they uh, basically cornered the market on, on the science um, and, you know, had a very narrow view of why plants grew and how to grow them well and everything else with no 
you know, it's, you know, it's a uh, Keynesianism applied to agriculture. You know, we're going to be dead in a hundred years. Who cares that we made a dust bowl, you know, and that's what they did. They made a dust bowl. The dust bowl was manufactured because of the mechanized farming, because they were just totally destroying the topsoil. So all this, you know, all these advancements, you know, so many people will talk about, well, you don't, you don't like science if you don't like, you know, mechanized farming and even like uh, GMOs and everything else. But it's, you know, you know, science is a way to answer questions. And, you know, exactly. th this is all answering the question, how do we do this with these tools? It's not answering the question, you know, they're not asking the question or is this the, you know, are these tools the best way to do this? It's about how do we do this with these tools? We have these tools, we've developed these methods. How do we perfect these methods? If you would go back in time and there was like, you know, you know, parallel universe time where there was never any mechanized farming um, to the extent there is today, especially with all the subsidies and everything else that is completely you know, I mean, the, of course, the farm subsidies and price and wage controls and everything else and everything, you know, they've contributed to the the depression. I mean, right. the uh, there are other methods that can be used to feed the same amount of people just by going about it differently. I mean, they were a lot of the methods that uh, that people have been people still use, like the intensive garden methods and stuff. Where, you know, you have, and also a lot of this shifted too, because you used to have economies that were, uh, that had a, just as a byproduct of the type of transportation had a lot of animal manure. And so the more um, mechanized transportation has become, the less extra animal, animal manure to deal with. And like a lot of these uh, older intensive methods, like the French intensive method, basically relies on a steady supreme force shit like you have to have all this horse manure to uh do this method and it's very similar to what i'm talking about but um it's like uh with the shift to mechanization there wasn't as much of those resources around to do large scale and they wanted to do large scale because they wanted you know centralization is a, a control you know, control scheme they wanted it more centralized. Yeah, what was it? Uh, uh, you, you, oh, I can't remember. Oh, gosh, was it? Um, it's uh, there was the quote. Uh, I know one of the portions of the quote was, "You control the food, you control the people." Yeah, or something along those lines. So I mean, yeah, that, that's that. Yeah, that's yeah. I, I think that has something to do with. It. I, I wish I remembered the the full quote. I but keep talking. I'm gonna look it up because I'm, I'm yeah, curious. Yeah. But yeah, go ahead. But I mean, you know, in all this, really, I mean, it's it happens all the time. I mean, it's happened in human history before. I mean, when agriculture, when, you know, when agriculture turned into being about mass production of cereal grains, it was the same type of thing. You had the same type of things going on. There was a centralization where a lot of the small holdings were forced out and the, uh, or, or forced to become parts of these larger ones. Yeah, basically you had a lot of people that wanted to escape that. And I mean, James C. Scott, like his, most of his works about that. And like, it was the same type of thing. There's the, peop the people that didn't want to be slaves to the agricultural system, because I mean, it's always been based, you know, ever since it was about mass production of cereal grains, it's been about slavery. I mean, it was like, how do we feed these slaves? These cere you know, this mass production of overproduction of cereal grains have made it possible for us to um, keep human slaves, you know, whereas if you, you know, you when you when you're when your uh, substance or sustenance, you know, economy agriculturally or food wise, there's no room for slaves. You know, you you, you got to feed the slave. So it's like there's a point right. of diminishing returns there, and like with cereal grains and their mass proliferation, um, you know, that was uh you know beginning of the state and beginning of the slave state as we know it. Right, right, and the and the quote I was referring to, Henry Kissinger, okay, uh, who controls the food supply, controls the people, who controls the energy, can control whole continents, who controls money on, uh, can control the world, and a variant is control oil, and you control the nations, control food, and you control the people. So yeah, obviously the all of the things most ne most necessary for for living for survival, 
um, yeah, it's no it's no surprise that uh, you know the state wanted to get heavily involved with that. Well, none, none, you know, none, none whatsoever. I mean, a lot of people talk about striking the root. I mean, the the root of a lot of this is the state monopolizing food production in some way, or controlling food production in some way. It's like you, uh, and and I really think this does come back around to uh, Vanu, because I think that's that's what Rayo was missing in his work, was any type of sustainable way to feed himself, and to for Vanuans to feed themselves besides going into town and buying bags of beans and rice, like there are other other methods that can be used. I've been wanting to write a lot about them. And it was like, after I read a bunch of James C. Scott, you know, his, uh, you know, things just clicked in my head because I already had this general idea from just researching, you know, stuff around the issue and not nearly reading him or anything, but like mm -hmm. he was kind of a catalyst that, uh, made a lot of things make, make sense to me. And one of the things I, I envision are, um, multiple, you know, a network of permaculture sites that have self-sustaining or nearly self-sustaining food on them that are part of a Vanuist network. So you can basically go from site to site and um, they're set up with, uh, with food that James C. Scott would have uh, termed as escape crops. Things that are very hard to tax because they're hard to quantify. Things that you have to actually know how to identify to know they're edible and stuff like that. And even if it's just an emergency food source for people trying to pursue that type of uh, either like semi-nomadic lifestyle, semi-sedentary, I think that's kind of like the missing link is the uh, permaculture for the, uh, you know, the, the designing of the autonomous zones. Yeah, you're, you're tall. I mean, that's, yeah, it's the second realm. And I think, I think Rayo kind of, I, obviously, I don't, I don't think permaculture was really a common thing back then. If it, if it was even if it was even a term, but he did talk about like food co-ops. Like he he wanted to see food co-ops come in. Uh, you know, not having to rely upon you know that mainstream infrastructure that that centralized food supply. Uh, so this this is certainly right in line. And I, and I I honestly love having conversations like this because. It, it's it, like there, it just seems to be kind of the the missing links to Vani, or maybe not the missing links, but but with with a technology that's available nowadays, and with say permaculture farming, it's so feasible, and it really it, it honestly wouldn't be that hard to do, um, and and it, obviously. <laughs> I, I I say I, I say that you know it wouldn't be that hard to do. There there would be there obviously have to be lifestyle changes and things. So it, it's not going to be easy. But if you just look at the technology available and how how much the prices have come down on, on actually you know achieving these things, it is really it, it's really not that hard to do. So um brought it brought it all, all back around you know <laughs> for, for for a lot of things. But you know I think this might be one of the only episodes of the alternative media where it started out you know heavily and actually I think Jamin you're probably one of the only guests where we can go really deep into technology in the first hour and then uh, dive really deeply into permaculture farming and then go on a really you know a really you know related tangent upon how uh, <laughs> how maybe maybe one of the reasons permaculture farming became uh, you know, came around was as a solution to kind of the mechanized, uh, centralized uh, control of food. So it all came around really, really nicely. And it's been about two hours right now. So I guess uh, to kind of close this out, do you have any uh, any thoughts you'd like to leave listeners with? Yeah. Um, uh, as, as far as permaculture farming and, and Vanu, um, you know, the, like the semi-sedentary approach to Vanu through van nomadism stuff, um, that was basically how things worked on this continent before there was a um a mass there was there was there were like um a couple mass die-offs from some disease this is pre-european but it's a myth that this continent was full of like untouched wilderness a lot of this continent was actually they were actually forest gardens that had a lot of um, human design to them. And one thing they would do, like the the uh, Aboriginal people of this you know area, is they would encourage things like chestnuts. 
not just to eat the chestnuts, because they knew encouraging the chestnuts would encourage the game species that ate the chestnuts. So basically, they would plant, plant chestnuts everywhere, and basically, they were doing permaculture. Permaculture is as old as humanity. I mean, it was it was how farming was done before there were you know these cereal states and these you know this complete focus on this cheap filler food to keep the slaves cereal working. Cereal states, I like that. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's what Scott calls them, but. But yeah, I mean, this this whole continent was full of forest gardens, and those the semi sedentary people, they would just go around eating the fruits of everybody's labor. They would, you know, people would grow, you know, had all you know all, all this, uh, I don't know, ambition to do this, and uh, you know that's how, that's see, if if you look at the anthropological stuff from Scott talking about all this stuff, the the beginnings of mass grain production of, as being farming was like thousands of years before agriculture after agriculture was discovered so before people went to mass plantings of one you know specific thing and everything else and what has evolved to the systems that we have now you know that's what that's those were the food systems in place they were you know based on a lot of uh, nuts and uh, fruit, like perennial perennial food crops that just kept coming back. And we're actually, uh, you know, I guess I could go on another hour, but <laughs> we're we're actually trying to bring bring some of that stuff back, some of the uh, some of the crops that they used. And um, we've had some luck with a crop called um, Apos americana or Apios americana. And it's a uh, legume. It's in the pea family. It fixes nitrogen. It gets little teeny peas on it or beans that, you know, you could eat, but there's like almost nothing there. But its claim to fame is that it grows these long strings of tubers that look like a necklace that can be the size of a small potato. And they just, wow. they just proliferate like crazy when they're in a place that is favorable to them. And um, they're kind of a new world escape crop or a temperate escape crop um, because they are, you know, you have to know what to look for. But like I have, uh, I have breeding stock from a few different places. And one of the places is Louisiana State University had a program to try to make it into a commercial crop again. And so I got the breeding stock from them and um, mine make tubers the size of mini potatoes. And there's something that you don't have to harvest. You can just leave in the ground and harvest as you need them. It's not like a seasonal thing or, okay, I got to harvest this or else it's going to be bad or no, they just keep, if you leave it in the ground, it's just going to grow more. They're just going to keep growing more and more and more. And they won't go bad or rot or anything. No, nope. I mean, they're, and they, that's crazy. Wow. And there's other crops like that. Now in, uh, like when Scott talks about New World escape crops, he talks about a cassava or tapioca, basically the same thing. Um, uh, yucca, all, all same the name for the same thing, but um, it has those same properties. And a lot of these escape crops, they take a couple of years to develop too. So there's definitely you know for a commercial crop, you know a farmer wants to get paid every year. He doesn't want to wait like three years to get a pay. You know what I mean? So right. Um, they're not lended very well to industrial agriculture, but they work very good in a layered system. Like this groundnut is a vine. It'll vine up whatever, and it produces its own nitrogen from the air. So it's not really taking much from what it's vining up. I mean, it, it could choke stuff out, but I, I haven't seen it choke much out. And if you put it with other things like it, like my... Uh, my plant guild, which is a group of plants you can grow together that I'm working on as soon as I can get these uh, ground nuts propagated enough, is a combination of the ground nuts, a, uh, a perennial pea, and a sunchoke. Sunchoke's Jerusalem artichoke. Jerusalem artichoke has the same type of properties. It's a sunflower family plant that grows from a tuber, like a potato, that's full of starch, and it will take over an area, and it's hard to get rid of once you got it. But I can grow all three of those things in the same space. So with the same amount of labor of digging one thing, 
you're digging something that's high in carbohydrates, you're digging something that's high in pea, like a, a pea protein, and you have, um, you can harvest the actual, you know, edible pea pods off of the peas. So that's a, that's a, a thing that I'm working on that I'm slowly getting enough of uh, groundnut together to make a mass planting and see how it goes. Right on, right on. That's, it's, this, the, the, all this stuff is so fascinating to me, whether it's the crypto anarchism or whether it's a permaculture farming, it's, it, it's, it's all, it, it, I don't like the, I don't like the rev, revolution, revolutions obviously are bad, but I'll, I'll use it for the sake of, uh, for, for the, for the sake of words here. Uh, you know, all, all of this stuff is just so revolutionary. It really is. I mean, it, it, it's a, I guess better, better way to put it is it's a, it's a game changer. Uh, you mentioned how, you know, permaculture farming might be one of the missing links in Vanu. I think it definitely is, a, and, and even more broadly, the second realm, uh, getting out of out of the centralized control of food, and into the second realm where uh, Venuans or anarchists or agorists, whatever whatever term you want to put on it, uh, you know uh, they they have their uh, they have their own food supply. Uh, in regards to technology, you know they've got their mesh networks, their their uh, their, their their mesh network outside of the uh, first realm infrastructure, and uh, I mean. It, it, it all comes together so well. It, it really, really does. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I want to thank you again for coming on the coming on the podcast. Anything else? Um, no, we're we're good. Um, I guess uh, just you can you can probably grok better where I'm going with the automation technology for the permaculture stuff too. I mean, I envision a uh, maybe a core group of people that don't want to be sed that want to be actually sedentary, and using a little bit of automation where it makes sense and using uh, just permaculture methods where the automation doesn't make sense, that a skeleton crew could maintain a large property with enough food to feed a lot of people with very little labor and probably enjoy themselves doing it. Right, right. So uh, so uh, I guess uh, where, where can the listeners find all of your projects? And uh, I mean, how, how can they, uh, you know, purchase some of your stuff? I and, and I guess but before that second question, buy a ghost pad, you know, buy, you know, uh, you know, su support jamming and get something fantastic in return that you cannot get from the state of the survival society. You certainly can't, especially from these close source projects. But uh, but where can people find uh, your projects and, and how can they, uh, you, know, you know, purchase what you're working on? Well, um, the best way to get in contact with me besides Facebook would be to go to neuron.semisynthetic.net. That's N-E-U-R-O-N dot S-E-M-I-S-Y-N-T-H-E-T-I-C dot net and um, ask a question. There's a, it's a WordPress page that you, I still didn't do anything with um, as far as re fixing it. But um, if you... If you make a post, it'll send me an email and um, to moderate the post, and I can get back to you, and uh, we can discuss the op options because they're all custom systems. Um, I can point you to some eBay auctions to see uh, different systems and what they've sold for and uh, what their specs were. But um, I basically convert the cores over and um, leave them ready for customization. I just the, my last system I just sold to a crypto anarchist in Spain, who's doing all the same stuff I'm doing, including permaculture and mesh networking and everything else. And he's, um, he spec'd it out for completely off grid. It has multiple batteries. It has provisions for software defined radio. It's running cubes. It's actually the most expensive system I've sold so far. He, he has like $1,200 into options on this thing, but it is badass. And I'm going to start offering these in this configuration using his as a prototype so um yeah i can ever and when i have these other projects ready to be marketed and it's always going to be small scale agorist as far as i'm concerned at this point for my marketing i um my strategy is to have a basket of goods that i make and sell and all i need to do is sell a few of each every month and i'll be good i'm not trying to uh roll this into, you know, some type of larger business. I just want to fund my R&D and keep my belly full and keep a roof over my head. Um, so, yeah, just go go to those places. Um, you can send me a friend request on eBay. If it's if you're from the cast, please just send me a message because it's, uh, it's pretty crazy with all the, the spam at this point. I probably have 100 friend requests just waiting in limbo because I don't, have time to vet people but 
Um, and uh, my email address, if you just want to email me directly without going through the website at all, it's jamin, J-A-M-I-N, at semisynthetic.net. So and I uh, check that account every day. You email me. We can uh, we can do some chatting. We can uh, you can Skype if you want to talk on the phone. You can figure out uh, what type of system you want and whether I can do that for you for what you want to pay, and we can go for there. Right on, right on. And again, I, I want to emphasize the fact that in the first hour of this episode, it was all crypto anarchism, and then in the second hour, it was uh, you know permaculture, and uh, you know these things tie together very nicely, and I I really love kind of the. Uh, you know how well these things tie together, but uh, but Jamin, thanks so much, man. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on, and I think we have uh, another discussion. Uh, you know, not planned yet, but another discussion that we we've talked about. Uh, you know, more more uh, you know related to the subject of Vanu. So looking forward to that. But for now, you know, uh, thanks so much, man, and uh, you know, hope hope all of your projects you know can continue going well, and that uh, you know we can help you get some sales. Oh. Well, thank you, man. Thanks for the encouragement. It does mean a lot. I was doing this stuff and uh, just doing it for myself for the longest time. And it's nice to actually have a, a positive reception 